one of the things that you mentioned in your book is generalist genes and the fact that uh, many, many genes influence a single trait and also a uh, gene can influence multiple traits. And uh, you, you mentioned also how psychopathologies in this context, they're not these distinct single gene disorders. They're really the extreme ends of normal traits. So tell us about how generalist genes work here and what we've found about how genes influence psychopathologies. Yes. Well, great. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the first point you were making is really called polygenicity. That is, many genes affect any trait. That's what I was saying before about heritability is due to thousands of tiny DNA differences. It could have been different. It could have been, as most people thought, as everyone thought, in the 90s even, that heritability is due to a few genes, you know, depression. Yeah, it's got to involve serotonin, you know, and a few other gene systems. Turns out it's not true. It involves thousands of tiny DNA differences. So if one trait like depression is affected by thousands of genes, well, there aren't enough genes to go around. There's only 20,000, 20, 30,000 so-called genes, that is bits of DNA that are transcribed and translated into amino acid sequences. So what that means is that the, the other side of the coin of polygenicity is what you were referring to as pleiotropy. That is, instead of each trait being influenced by many genes, each gene then will affect many traits. And that's what makes gene brain behavior pathways so difficult to uncover. But uh, it, it is a, a, a very important point. And that also then suggests what you were saying about generalist genes, that the idea that we're going to find these genes cause this trait and these genes cause that trait doesn't make any sense when you think about these two major principles of polygenicity and pleiotrope. And what we're finding empirically is that that's really the case. Now that we can put these, we haven't really talked about the DNA revolution and genome-wide association studies and polygenic scores, but we can predict behavior like depression, putting thousands of these DNA differences together in what we call a polygenic score. And um, when we do that, when we first did that in, say, 2007 and 2010, the shocking finding was that a polygenic score that predicts say, bipolar depression, which is a, a more severe type of depression that involves cycles of mania where you're just wildly happy and uncontrolled to severe depression. That's why it's called bipolar depression. Well, polygenic score for bipolar depression correlated highly with a, a polygenic score for schizophrenia. And the reason this was so shocking was that in psychiatric classification schemes, the first dividing line is between bipolar and schizophrenia. So much so that until the new diagnostic manual came out a few years ago called DSM-5, you couldn't actually be diagnosed as bipolar and schizophrenic because they're completely different and they're assumed to be etiologically different. This whole psychiatric classification system was based on the idea that, you know, you could have committees of people sitting together and saying, well, you need two of those for three months to be schizophrenic and you need four of these other things. You know, it was just kind of historically evolved. And um, what the genetics has shown us is not just that schizophrenia and bipolar are genetically correlated, but everything in the psychiatric classification system is correlated. There aren't genes for schizophrenia versus genes for bipolar or uh, anorexia or ADHD. The same genes are affecting many traits. Now, that, that's not all the heritability, but it's a substantial component. And it was a, a shocking and new finding that people are still trying to come to terms with. And it's called the, the generic sort of bumper sticker for this is P, a little p. I mentioned little g before as general cognitive ability. Little p is general psychopathology. 
that is, to a large extent, genes that affect psychopathology are general. And whether you develop one type of diagnosed disorder or another is more a matter of the environment than it is genetics. But there are also unique genetic influences on different problems. But the second thing genetics has shown us is what you were talking about with, uh, I call it the bumper sticker, abnormal is normal, dimensions and disorders. I don't think there are any disorders because genetically, if there are thousands of genes that affect the trait, then we're talking about a normal distribution of genetic liability. As opposed to if you had a single gene that caused schizophrenia, well, then you either have that or you don't. It's dichotomous. And that's the way people think about these psychopathologies. And, and it's wrong genetically that it's quantitative, not qualitative. And that isn't just a semantic right. thing. It, it really is very important. And, and I think what's holding back psychiatric research is the medical model that assumes, you know, the first thing you do is you diagnose people and you say, do you have this disorder or do you not have this disorder? But if there is no disorder, if it's a continuum, then a lot of people you're saying are normal, are very close to being psychotic and vice versa. You know, people you call schizophrenic are pretty normal. And we know when you experience, when you work with other people with psychopathology, it's not like they wake up one day and they're schizophrenic. And a lot of it has to do with how adaptive they are. My PhD mentor, everyone said he would be locked up if he weren't so bright. He was able to compensate for his <laughs> very weird personality by being so bright and, you know, saying he can control himself when he has to in public, which wasn't the case when he was dealing with his poor graduate student in his office. Right. You know, Mia, for instance, that always seemed to me like the very extreme end of openness, you know, or creativeness, divergent thinking for that matter. You know, people who yeah. really generate new ideas and really like to play with reality. You know, what is schiz schizophrenia? At the end of the day, it's having a very blurred line between reality and imagination. And that is an adaptive trait in certain situations. A lot of artists are very, very creative yeah. and could be said, you know, to, to be on that, on that verge. Uh, for instance, attention deficit disorder, uh, where, what, what trait would you say ADD and ADHD correlate with? Well, it's largely defined in terms of low attention span and high activity level. And, you know, the point you're making is, is exactly what I'm interested in studying now. If the genetic liability is normal, then what about people with high polygenic scores, say for schizophrenia or ADHD? They're not at all diagnosed. Like my highest polygenic score, I have the world's first profile of polygenic scores for psychopathology and a lot of other traits. And my highest polygenic risk score is for obesity. We could talk about that, but more relevant now is the next highest one is for schizophrenia. Now I'm at the 85th percentile in this normal distribution. So it's quite a high score. It's a standard deviation above the mean. It's a way less than 99% and 1% of the population is diagnosed as schizophrenia. But nonetheless, just to the point you're making, I don't know if you were cheating and you knew this research, but when people took polygenics <laughs> in the population, and asked exactly the question you're asking. What about people with high polygenic scores for schizophrenia who aren't at all schizophrenic, which is, you know, a lot of people like me. And what they found is exactly what you're saying, is that people with high polygenic scores were more likely to be in creative professions, novelists, designers, artists. And it could be exactly as you're saying. They can, you know, get this get outside the normal frame, you know, maybe get outside the box of the way people conventionally think about things. And maybe, I mean, it's almost, it's got to be too simplistic, but maybe if you get too far outside the box, you lose touch with reality, which is kind of a defining characteristic of schizophrenia. 
But I, it's so cool that you mentioned that. Exactly. From an experiential point of view, whereas yeah. there are three studies now that show that what I just said, that high polygenic scores mean, you know, you're more creative if for schizophrenia. One of the traits that I always think of here is aggression, for instance. And aggression can be channeled into amazing pursuits. It can make, uh, you know, for military generals and it can make for, you know, leadership, people who aren't afraid of being disagreeable. But if you don't channel those same traits into positive areas, you'll get a criminal. So the same traits can have positive and negative manifestations or adaptive and maladaptive manifestations. And it really depends on how we develop those traits and how we integrate them into our lives as social beings. Yes. Well, and that's the other side of um, this phrase uh, that I use, dimension disorders are dimensions. They're quantitative, not qualitative. Because just to the point you're making, nobody asks, what's at the other end of these distributions? Like, what's at the other end of this distribution that I'm at the 94th percentile on for obesity, the polygenic score for obesity? But, but so, okay, so I have a high risk for, for obesity. But nobody asks about, what about the other end? Does that just mean, if you have a very low polygenic score for obesity, does that just mean you have a low risk from becoming obese? Or could it mean something entirely different? My hypothesis is that maybe people at the low end are so sensitive to food cues and that sort of thing. Maybe that's where eating disorders lie. Do you know? Because you're... Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So as Oscar Wilde said, all things in moderation, although he added, including moderation being Oscar Wilde, but you know, maybe being in the middle of these distributions is a good thing. Like ADHD, you mentioned. High ADHD is defined as um, low attention span and high activity, you know, motoric activity. So what's at the other end? It isn't just necessarily, you know, low risk for ADHD, but rather it could be too much attention. Compulsiveness, exactly. People who are over-focused and really have a hard time switching gears. Yep. They have tunnel vision. It's like they're always on Ritalin. Uh, and, you know, on another condition like this is OCD for instance, yep. that would also be uh, the high end of conscientiousness, being so uh, meticulous and so orderly and uh, discussed sensitivity is correlated with conscientiousness. And we know that people who have OCD have a fear of contamination. So something that is so positive uh, in a certain level, if it's taken to the extreme, can be really problematic for people. Yes.